Well, one of the major effects of Hurricane Sandy was on telecommunications, and that's our topic this week on The Communicators. Christopher Gutman McCabe is the vice president of CTIA, the Wireless Association. They represent all the wireless companies. Mr. Gutman McCabe, overall, what was the effect of Sandy on your member organizations, the Verizons, the ATTs, Sprints, et cetera? Sure. Thank you, Peter, and thanks for thanks for having me back. I mean, I, I think if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind taking a half step back and just providing a little perspective on on this storm and sort of ultimately on the impact that it had. But if you if you listen to uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who said that the damage was unprecedented, uh, that it may be the worst storm that the city has ever faced, and the tidal surge previous high was 10 feet. For this storm, it was 14. Governor Christie said the damage in New Jersey was unthinkable. I mean, we had fires, we had hurricane force winds, we had, you know, massive flooding, we had feet of snow. And if you look at that and you look at the flooding to the subway systems and the shutdown of, of the stock exchanges, you start to get a sense of the massive scale and scope of, of this storm. And yet the networks performed. I mean, I, I've read, you know, dozens of stories over the last couple of weeks about how for many consumers, their only link to information, their only tie to any sort of information or to people was through their smartphone, you know, linking social media and their smartphone. And so while there was obviously an impact on, on cell sites, I think the networks performed really, really pretty well. 25% of cell towers went down. Were they, are cell towers hurricane proof? Sure. Well, it, it, first of all, I think it's important to note that when you say 25% of cell towers were impacted, that doesn't mean 25% of service was impacted. Uh, cell towers, some of them are capacity-based to add additional capacity, maybe in rush hour areas or high traffic areas, but a lot of them are, are uh, to provide basic service. And so when you say 25% were impacted, that doesn't mean service was down by that. So obviously some were impacted, and, and our towers rely on two things. They rely on power, and they rely on backhaul. And, and each one could have an impact on, on whether or not that tower's up and running. And I think we found out in Sandy that it was about even, the split. It was, uh, some of it was that there was a lack of power. And by power, we're not talking hours. I mean, in, in many instances, we have people who are out without power now. We're talking you know, days and, and weeks uh, without power. And yet, we were able to get uh, you know, generators in there, get additional fuel, uh, make sure that the, you know, where, where towers went down that were critical towers, we got them up pretty quickly. And as an industry, I think you saw those numbers, you know, really the next day went down and the day after that went down and you saw creative uh, efforts by carriers, some of them linking networks together, you know, others really uh, getting fuel very quickly out to the, the generators so that the cell sites were back up and running. So I think it was, I think you saw, and, and the, it seems like the press sort of has, has uh, proved this out, that there were a lot of folks who were able to, to utilize their phones in spite of the fact that there wasn't power, in spite of the fact that the landlines weren't working. Well, Mr. Gutman McCabe, if we could talk about that landline issue, because uh, a lot of people have kept landlines for so-called emergencies, sure. and it it appears right now that it looks like the, the, the wireless uh, phones were more reliable than the fiber optic, the non-copper type uh, wire lines. Sure, sure, and, and, and you know, the reality is, again, we're talking a storm of almost biblical proportions, and so it had an impact on the wireline networks, but it also had an impact on the subways, and it had an impact on all transportation and bridges and tunnels, and so, um, you know, the reality is this, this was something that caused some serious, uh, you know, some serious impact on, on infrastructure. And yet, I think as you say, uh, you know, the wireless networks performed, performed pretty well. And part of that is the efforts by the carriers in advance of the storm to pre-position materials to make sure that they had backup supplies in place and that wherever possible they do have backup power. And, and in instances where they could, they brought in satellite trucks to actually use satellite to backhaul the information, uh, avoiding where, where it was necessary, avoiding the landline networks and using satellite, using generators, using batteries to, to really try to keep the network up and running. Now, what about emergency communications? How were they affected the interoperability issue as well? Sure, so we actually saw that, uh, that from our perspective, the PSAPs, we call them the, the, the public safety answering ports, points, the folks that field 911 calls, very few of them went down. Uh, they, they, they had a nice uh, sort of backup power in place. They, um, they're, they're sort of consolidated, so they don't have a lot of areas that they have to really protect. Um, so we saw that, that 911 worked well, and I think 
the, the mayor's office in New York City talked about, boy, use texting where you can. I think that's a good message to deliver to consumers. Use texting wherever you can. Leave the phone calls to 911, to the, to the really important calls. And, and otherwise use texting or, or use your data connections to, to gather information. Did the spectrum get flooded with, with information and, and overloaded? Sure, their, their, I mean, usage was pretty tremendous and we found this out, you know, whenever you have uh, an issue where there's a lot of people who need information, you find that, that the networks really get flooded. I, I saw numbers, two, three, four, five hundred to fifteen thousand percent increases on some websites and and you saw um, in a lot of the app application stores that the apps that that quickly ran to the top were those that gave you access to information or the mobile flashlight I think was one of the other ones that, that really found uh, sort of a lot of people downloading it um, but there was a surge in traffic but but I didn't see numbers that suggested that there was a significant amount of call blocking or dropping I think uh, I think the networks handled the surge pretty well. Now, it, we're taping this interview on November 15th, and I was in lower Manhattan last night and had a lot of trouble connecting on my iPad and on my cell phone. Mm -hmm. Is that still due to Sandy? Yeah, I mean, we, we there are still areas in lower Manhattan and in the boroughs that don't have power. And, and in those instances, I mean, one of our carriers is using 100,000 gallons of fuel a day to, to power their generators. That's just one carrier with 1,500 generators that are going. So, you know, there, there will be t a time period before we get back up to full, you know, full capacity again. Um, but that isn't, you know, for a lack of, of trying. I think it's important to remind people that the folks that run these companies are actually also consumers. They're family members. I mean, their goal is to make sure that these networks are up and running both personally and professionally. And, and I think you see that. I, I, folks moved out of their houses. Some houses some of the employees' houses were destroyed. They moved into, you know, into uh, company quarters. They moved into some of the, um, the you know, the, the, the storefronts to actually run their operations uh, from there. And, you know, it's an effort when you see a storm of this magnitude. It's really an effort to try to get everything back to, to completely status quo. And Christopher Gutman McCabe, your industry prevented or uh, fought FCC recommendations that there be backup power at cell towers, et cetera. And last week on a blog post, you said that uh, um, eight-hour mandated backup power would not have been a panacea anyway because right. of this storm. Well, if you think of this storm and, and if you can visualize the scope of the storm as it approached the coast, the storm wasn't even through the, the areas when the eight hours had passed, right? Many people lost their power and the storm was still hitting them for another 12 to 24 hours. And for certain areas, we're talking 360 to 400 hours without power. And so when you look at it in the context of a sort of mandated eight hour uh, backup requirement, certainly it would not. I mean, logically it would not have been a panacea. And, and what we saw with our industry was the ability to react uh, flexibly, to, to be able to move assets in, to relocate assets from areas that weren't, weren't hard hit, and, and to utilize resources in a way that, that makes the networks run uh, well. I think if you look back at, at the Hurricane Katrina recommendations before the FCC acted, those recommendations were for a voluntary, uh, flexible framework. And so that's what we were pushing. We, we didn't disagree with the goal of the FCC to keep the networks running. Of course we don't. That, that's in, in you know, every carrier's uh, best interest. It's in the industry's best interest. It's just how do you go about doing this? And, and, and so for us, when you look at a storm of this magnitude, it's having the ability to react, to move assets around. And we had carriers that had to put in you know, thousands of feet of power cables to drag you know, cables up to the rooftop to power generators so that we could have cell sites working. Well, let's go back to Katrina in 05. What kind of investment, what have wireless companies done to improve their reliability during such emergencies? Sure, so you see carriers in every instance where it's possible putting in backup power. And you can imagine instances where it's not. We put towers in on church steeples. We put them on the side of buildings in major metropolitan areas. Um, you know, in, in closets within, within buildings. And it becomes difficult in certain areas to have backup power. And yet, you know, the carriers try to put in batteries where they can't put in generators. Where they can put in generators, they put it in with as much fuel as they're allowed. But when you're working with building codes or zoning restrictions or environmental uh, raw, uh, laws and, and, and limitations, you know, you have to work within those confines. And, 
the carriers learn something with every you know, natural disaster or every storm that they face. They learn, you know, what is the right floor to put equipment on? What is the right floor to put fuel? How much fuel do you need? How many, you know, what we call cows and colts, you know, which are cell sites on wheels or light trucks. Um, and, and the carriers get better. They, they learn how to, how to work with fuel vendors in advance so that they have this hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel uh, in reserve. They learn how to coordinate with first responders uh, in advance and before, during, and after. We meet with FEMA and the Department of Homeland Security and the FCC in advance of a storm like this in the lead up, in the days you know, while it's happening, and in the days after on multiple, multiple calls to make sure that, that the folks have the right uh, credentials in place to be able to get through blockades that public safety puts in place. So, uh, you know, the investment is ongoing and it's tremendous to, to make sure that these networks continue to run. What's the cost of this storm to your member organizations? You know, it's not something that I don't think anyone really looks at. I think, I think they look at it as part of, you know, the business of making sure their networks are up and running, that consumers continue to, to get served. I haven't seen a number. I don't expect that I will. But again, I don't think it's I mean, obviously, it's important in the context of, uh, uh, you know, of the companies uh, continuing to operate, but it, it's, it pales in comparison to the desire to keep the networks up and running. Will consumers see a rate increase because of the cost? You know, I, I don't expect so, but, uh, you know, we, we generally don't, don't really focus on, on those sorts of things at the Trade Association. But again, when you look at the, the efforts and the desire to keep the networks running, uh, that is something that's paramount to these companies. And finally, Mr. Gutman McCabe, when you, uh, if you w attend or if the FCC, uh, you know, has an oversight hearing or looks at this issue of Sandy and telecommunications, what's your what's your top line to them? What what are you going to tell them? Well, so you know, the, again, we share the same goals as as any government official, which is to make sure that the networks are up and running, and. I think it would just be a matter of maintaining, you know, and ensuring that there's education, that people understand the scale and scope of this disaster, that, that carriers did a lot to pre-position materials, that the networks actually performed uh, very well, and, and that they were up and running, and, uh, and then work with public safety and work with government officials to make sure that people have access to fuel when it's necessary, that they can get their supplies through, that they're not subject to uh, parking restrictions or restrictions on high occupancy vehicle lanes um, that you know s uh, fuel isn't confiscated at certain areas and New York and New Jersey did a great job but there are always lessons to learn. Christopher Gutman McCabe is the Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at CTIA, the Wireless Association. You're watching The Communicators on C-SPAN. And now joining us from Basking Ridge, New Jersey, is Robert Mudge, who is the president of Consumer and Mass Business Markets for Verizon. Mr. Mudge, what was the overall effect of Hurricane Sandy on Verizon in the Northeast? Hi, Peter, thank you for having me. And uh, I wanna get right into that, but first I can't help but say uh, how much my heart goes out to all the people I've seen in the millions of impacted uh, customers and other people from this storm. Uh, and it's been great to be out with our employees up and, and, and see what people are coming through together. Uh, so Peter, this was a pretty impactful storm. As you know, uh, it hit us right, uh, right in the middle of our operating area in New Jersey and came at us uh, with a, uh, a path that was a thousand miles wide. So it impacted us both in our physical distribution plant uh, our poles and our cables, as you might expect, both from the wind and from the storm surge, and in our central office facilities where we lost power and our backup power process uh, really had to kick in and carry over 300 central offices uh, that were impacted at the peak of the storm. So how many, how many folks lost power? Has everybody gotten it back on? Um, if you could speak to that. Sure. So, it, you know, we had, based on, again, the width of the footprint, we had, uh, we had upwards to five and a half, six million of our customers who had lost power. So folks really felt uh, the impact. And again, we felt that uh, on the central office side also. Uh, at the peak of the storm, we had over a million customers out of service. Um, all of uh, the Fios customers, as soon as power came back, uh, most of this uh, service was restored, 
And now, a couple weeks later, we're doing the final touches on the physical replacement of poles and cables because in many cases, we had to work with or go in after the power was restored and we were safe and it was able for our folks to work aloft or even in some of the manholes. So the, one of the lessons learned was that fiber is very resilient and uh, we had good success with, with that network. On the central office side, we had other, you know, very important impact. Uh, many people are aware of the impact on southern Manhattan where the storm surge actually took out the power plants from both our West Street and Broad Street central offices, which is, again, right down in that southern tip of Manhattan, but we had almost 300 others. All of those uh, central offices are back one way or another. The vast majority are on commercial power. We have a handful that are still on our generators, including Broad Street. Uh, and my partner and I, Tony Malone, expect the Broad Street CO to be back on commercial power uh, within a matter of days. Now, Mr. Mudge, are there limits to cell phone and internet technology when it comes to an emergency like this? I mean, 40% of uh, Americans are now uh, landlineless. They don't have landlines anymore, just cell phones. Well, the cell phone network, again, uh, I can speak a little bit more broadly. Uh, even at the height of the storm, our, our wireless network was operating at 94% capacity. We're already back to uh, full capacity pre-storm. So I think many people, Peter, not just through the telecommunications, but with the power outage, you know, learned and, and found out that electricity is very important along with telecommunications. So... I think that it's a reminder that, and for many of our customers, that good wireless service and good wireline service is, is very helpful because they can help offset each other. Now, do the, uh, the so-called triple play packages that are offered by the cable companies and Verizon and others, um, do they have the same reliability as the old style telephones with the copper wires, et cetera? It does. I think there's a little difference in the, in the, in, in the architecture. Uh, that make it a little bit different. But by and large, we've seen that fiber is in fact more resilient than copper. Uh, when the power is out, it will impact Fios, although we do have a battery backup so that there can be emergency calling. And then again, going back to your other point uh, where there's a crossover with wireless usage, you know, that gives customers a lot of comfort in terms of their, their ability to make an emergency call or reach a loved one. When the power is out and TVs are down and PCs are down, then that internet and TV usage is kind of impacted more broadly than just the telecommunications. But again, we really found that once we got power back, we actually returned service back to our Fios customers, our fiber customers, quicker than we have with some of our copper customers. I happen to be in Long Beach, Long Island on one of our work sites uh, just the other day. And I think it's a really good example. It's a community with about 16,000 customers. Our copper plant, we're still trying to repair. And in fact, I expect that we'll migrate the co traditional copper plant over to fiber because 10,000 Fios customers in that community are back in service. So I think, Peter, you know, a hurricane is one thing, a snowstorm can be another, day-to-day -day thunderstorms. I think the context of reliability needs to be thought through many different potential events, not just one. And our data is very clear. The fiber is more resilient in a storm and it has greater opportunity for faster restoral. Now, Mr. Mudge, if I could, I'd like to get you to respond to what Jessica Rosenworcel, a member of the FCC, uh, had to say about Hurricane Sandy and telecommunications. She said, it is time for an honest conversation about network reliability in the wireless and digital age. It is time to ask hard questions about backup power and how to make our networks more dependable when we need them most. It's an interesting question. I think it's one we've been asking ourselves at Verizon, though, for decades. If you think about our wireless networks, they're all backed up with battery, most with generators. If you think about our central offices that lost power, again, 300 central offices, we actually have belt and suspenders. On top of commercial power, we have batteries and we have generators. And our preparation before the storm uh, had us out starting generators, topping off fuel, and putting personnel in key locations. So I think it's a fair question, but it's one that I'm very confident that at Verizon, we've already asked, we'll continue to ask, and there'll be room for improvement. We want to continuously get better as we manage power.
but I'm very comfortable with where we sit today and, and, the, and how well we've come through this storm. Now, what has been improved since Katrina in 2005 or even derecho uh, this past summer or 9-11? Well, it's interesting. I was thinking about our discussion today, and I was thinking a little bit about 9-11. So I think part of what's improved, Peter, is that uh, we're a team that, our, that we ourselves are resilient. We know how to handle major disaster, and I think going through 9-11 toughened up the entire team. I think it also reminded us that we have a very vast company here with assets and networks across wireless, wireline traditional, wireline Fios, that together, both in providing normal services and in times of recovery, really give us the power to respond to customers faster. I also think, again, if we go back in recent times, our dedication to making sure that the backup power works, that it's reliable, we run it monthly on our generators, sometimes weekly, and we're prepared and we plan for these outages. So I think that's been a strong reminder also, Peter. Now, Mr. Mudge, uh, according to reports, about 25% of cell towers uh, went out of service because of Hurricane Sandy in the area. And the Wall Street Journal recently is this paragraph. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina in 05, the FCC tried to require backup batteries at all cell phone towers, but wireless carriers successfully sued to block the rule, arguing that they needed flexibility in how they provided backup power. Are, are cell towers for Verizon backed up? Yes, they are. They have battery backup, and again, most have an emergency generator on them. And those that don't, we can serve with the generator within a matter of hours. And I put that, again, from a factual standpoint with even at the peak of the storm, with the vast power outages that we had up and down the coast, 94% of our cell towers were operating. We were close to 99% within a matter of two days, and we're back uh, to, to full service right now. Now, in a press release that Verizon sent out, uh, you talked about telephone poles and how many telephone poles you've had to replace. Uh, yeah. nearly 8,000. What's the cost of that? Well, it's, it's, it's quite a cost, and we're still adding up the cost, but, you know, we're not really accounting for, this isn't a time for us to be uh, really as focused on cost as perhaps my CFO would like. We've been very focused on getting the polls in quickly. In fact, we pre-purchase 9,000 of those polls in advance and pre-positioned them for the storm. So we'll clearly have, in terms of uh, the, the network and the customer base uh, that, 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 that I manage, you know, cost in the millions, but I really don't have a, a number yet that we've racked and stacked in total, but it will be substantial. Do you know uh, offhand how much one telephone pole costs? Yeah, a typical telephone pole can run anywhere from $300 up to $700. They've, and, it, and it literally depends on the width of the pole, the class, which is the class, and the height of that pole. And finally, Mr. Mudge, uh, what happened down in lower Manhattan? And you, you talked about the flooding down there and the power going out in your network areas. Uh, but is there, a, is there a thought of moving those facilities out of lower Manhattan? At this time, Peter, there really isn't, and I'll tell you why. The issue was really power related. Our switch gear and our telecommunications gear stayed intact and was operational. Uh, where that entire area, all businesses were overwhelmed, was with the unprecedented storm surge. As we rebuild that area, Peter, we're relocating and redoubling our efforts to be uh, on, on, with the power network. So some of the cases where we had our power plant uh, below grade level or at ground level, we're going to, when we're done with this uh, repositioning, we expect to have a lot more fiber in the ground, which is more resilient, and we'll have a power plant that uh, will be more, uh, more able to handle uh, a, sto a storm surge like that if, God forbid, we ever got something that bad again. Robert Mudge is president of the Consumer and Mass Business Markets for Verizon. You're watching The Communicators on C-SPAN. And as we continue our look at telecommunications and the impact that Sandy had, especially in the Northeast, we're joined by Harold Feld, who is Senior Vice President of the Consumer Interest Group Public Knowledge. Mr. Feld, we've talked to both CTIA and to Verizon.
both groups, both organizations said that uh, wireless service particularly did well during Sandy. What's your assessment? Well, my assessment here is some networks did well, some networks did less well, but we don't really have solid information about this because there are no reporting requirements on these networks. There are no standards by which we measure their performance. Uh, and it's entirely voluntary whether they want to talk to the FCC or not or talk to their uh, state and local governments or not. So uh, I take their word for it that uh, uh, they responded well. I also uh, have anecdotally heard that some of these guys maybe did less well. Uh, and I think a first step is we have to find out who did well, who didn't do well, and how we make sure that everybody's doing well. And how do we get to, how do we make sure everybody's doing well? Well, back in the... Uh, uh, election, Mitt Romney said in a primary that, you know, if you can delegate stuff like FEMA from the federal government to the states or even better to the private sector, then that's better. And then Sandy hit uh, and everybody understood, you know, in an emergency, having some federal coordination is good. Having some basic federal rules that tell everybody how to behave in, in a crisis when you don't want to take the time to think it up from scratch, that's good. And the same thing's true here in telecommunications. We have delegated to the private sector all of our emergency response for our cellular networks, for these new what we call IP or internet protocol based networks like cable phone service, like Vonage. So when it comes to the old copper network, the old telephone network, we know all about that. We have crews on call, it's self-powered, reliability was built into that thing from day one. That's why New Yorkers were scrambling for pay phones when they couldn't get uh, uh, their cell and their cable service to work. We don't need to take the old rules from the Ma Bell days and put them on top of all of these new networks, but we do need to have the federal government and the state governments take a look at what happened and figure out what are the ground rules? What are the things that you wanna have in place before an emergency hits? And what are the things you need to be doing before a crisis so that when the crisis hits, everybody's operating on the same page, everybody's moving as quickly as they can, uh, and everybody's able to do the best job that they can restoring critical services. Well, as somebody who, who uh, watches telecommunications, somebody who was involved in the Media Access Project for years and now with public knowledge, uh, what do you think the starting point should be for uh, mandated service or mandated rules? Well, I think the starting point is actually we need to take a look at what happened. And that means the first kind of mandated thing is you're going to sit down and you're going to tell us honestly what happened. It can be, you know, in a private conversation with the regulators, but don't give us your little 8 by 10 glossy. Don't, uh, you know, just tell us how wonderful it was and forget the fact that you didn't have enough uh, trucks online or whatever it was. Tell us honestly what worked and what didn't. The next step from that, I would say, is everybody ought to file an emergency preparedness plan. Uh, and that ought to be with the Federal Communication Commission and with the state emergency responders. So that, okay, we need to know what's your assessment of how strong your network is and what do you have in place so that if that 100-year hurricane hits, and from what we've all been hearing, we're going to have a lot more of those 100-year hurricanes uh, hitting, uh, everybody knows what your plan is. This will force the companies to actually go through and have a plan rather than just our plan is to really, really hope we get 99 good years. And we, as the public through the Federal Communications Commission and the state agencies, will know what the plan is is in place. The next thing that's equally important is we got to have a common language of how we're talking about this. When we talk about things like network reliability and how long are things up, the different networks mean different things when they say it. So it's not like... AT&T is lying when they say, oh, we think our network held up fairly well and reliably, and it's taking them three extra days to get their service online than it's taken Verizon to get their service online. It's that there isn't a set way to talk about this, so that we have set measures that we could say, yeah, you guys are doing a good job, or you guys aren't doing a good job. The last thing I, I, I just want to point out is we should acknowledge and reward some of the original thinking that took place here. I think that uh, the cable operators in particular, uh, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, a number of the others, really stepped up for the first time as 
communications infrastructure players and not just cable operators. Comcast and then other operators made their Wi-Fi access points available free, which was a huge benefit for people who otherwise didn't have connection. Uh, they're, uh, they put a, made a whole bunch of announcements about if your home got washed away in a flood, you don't have to return the set-top box, which there have been some embarrassing incidents after things like tornadoes where you know you read cable company finds customer four hundred dollars for set top box that was destroyed in tornado so they're getting better about that and you know they ought to uh, be commended for that I think Verizon probably ought to be acknowledged for having of the major carriers done the best job but we need to look at why they were successful and how they were successful and then say you know all that stuff that you did that was successful we ought to make that a standard we ought to make that if not an enforced standard we ought to at least spread that knowledge out there so that everybody else can perform as well the next time I want to go back to what you just said and what you wrote on your blog which was about uh, private industry taking over this infrastructure and having control of this infrastructure um, recently or a couple of years ago the companies succeeded in not having to put up backup battery power on their cell towers, um, something that you wrote about. Um, if you would, just a little bit more on this private-public yeah, partnership. And, and this is where we, you know, we need to move away from the idea that, well, this is not like the old Bell system. These are, are private networks but with private capital and therefore there can be no regulation and no standards. We're all dependent on this stuff now. And no matter what kind of a private company you are, you know, you still, if you're a, if you're, you know, if you're Walmart, you still have to put fire exits in and a fire suppression system in. That's not a violation of the fact that you built your store with private capital. It's we recognize that we need to have some basic public safety rules. These networks are now providing critical services in an emergency. This is exactly the time when you need to be connected. And Ten years ago, or, or even in the wake of Katrina about five years ago, when the, those first reports came out, it was possible to say, well, look, you know, these networks are young, these guys are investing, they've got all the right incentives to make this reliable, uh, and for the industry to say no regulation, no, even no standards, nothing enforceable, you know, we're past that. There's a point at which you just got to bite the bullet and say, look, guys, um, we're all about you're doing a great job or not so great a job, but too many people are dependent on you to let this just be private sector decision making. We at least have to know how reliable these networks are. We got to know how to plan. And frankly, in an emergency, it is really to everyone's benefit to have some of these rules in place. I know that everybody focuses on cost, and that's right. You know, this is one of the criticisms of my blog post came from uh, a friend of mine at uh, Cato who said, well, yeah, everybody wants cheap phones until an emergency hits, and then they're like, where's my backup power? Because that costs money. And he's right. It does cost money. But it's a decision we have to make about the trade-offs. There are a lot of good things about the current private structure. We have r multiple networks so that if Comcast goes down, maybe Verizon can take up the slack. T-Mobile and AT&T did a roaming agreement that let them share their network infrastructure at a critical moment. So there's a lot of good stuff that goes on in the private sector. But what we really got to do is acknowledge the role of the federal government and the state governments in making sure that in the crisis and in the lead up to the crisis, we're ready and that in the crisis itself, everybody knows what to do and the pieces work smoothly. And finally, the FCC just announced they're going to hold field hearings on Sandy and telecommunications. Yes, and, and I think the public notice uh, that they issued struck the right tone and asked all the right questions. Um, it is an opportunity to take a look at uh, our world, which has a bunch of different networks in many of these locations, although we also have to remember that in a lot of rural areas, uh, you have one network, not three or four or five different networks, but uh, there are a lot of opportunities here. Uh, there's a lot of good work that's been going on, but at the same time, there's also a lot of liability and concern. There's a lot of people's lives literally are dependent on this now. This isn't a luxury anymore. Uh, and particularly, we're shifting all of our emergency response stuff over uh, from television and radio. We're now including texting in that and internet messages. And if we're going to build our future on these really powerful networks and that are capable of doing so much more than the old networks, we have to acknowledge that, you know, time has come to have some basic principles in place, some basic safeguards, so that when the crisis hits, 
People know what to do and they're able to do it. Harold Feld, a Senior Vice President of Public Knowledge. This is the Communicators on C-SPAN and up next, Representative Elliot Engel. And Congressman Engel is a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and recently wrote a letter to Fred Upton, the Chairman of the Commerce Committee, uh, hoping to hold hearings on telecommunications and Sandy. Representative Engel, what's your goal with those hearings? Well, you know, my district, as, as most districts in New York, uh, were disrupted uh, by Hurricane Sandy. And uh, when we look at the disruption, it's clear that telecommunication services were one of the key services that failed to perform. And so um, we want to, to have a hearing just to find out uh, what went wrong and what we can do to ensure in the future that the same thing doesn't happen again. Um, the FCC reported that the storm knocked out a quarter of the cell towers in an area spreading across 10 states, and people lost wireless television, telephone, and Internet services. And obviously it puts lives at risk, and it's clear that um, uh, there either wasn't correct uh, preparation or uh, we were caught uh, um, by surprise. And so this is not something that we want to happen again. The the purpose of this hearing would not be to point any fingers. It would simply be to find out what happened and how uh, Congress can get involved in making sure that this doesn't happen again, because I, I'm sure that um, storms such as Sandy are becoming more and more commonplace, unfortunately, and uh, we don't want a repetition of what just happened in the Northeast. Now, we've heard from the uh, wireless industry earlier that uh, they were relatively pleased with how their networks operated and how the wireless services continued uh, during Sandy. Well, I would like to hear from them, and I think that's why a hearing would, would be so important. Uh, you know, again, this is not to point fingers at anybody. Obviously, the, the telecommunications industry was, uh, was knee-deep in this, literally, and um, they can perhaps enlighten us as to what went right, what went wrong. Um, obviously, all wasn't hunky-dory. There were so many people that lost power, and uh, is that something that uh, could not be prevented? Is it something that if we change certain things might be prevented in the future? Um, you know, last summer a storm knocked out 911 in the, in the East Coast. These things are becoming more and more commonplace. So what a hearing would do would allow us to investigate the reliability of the communications networks and to identify and highlight the best practices and, when necessary, to address potential vulnerabilities in our communications infrastructure. So I, I would welcome, obviously, I want to hear what the telecommunications industry has to say, and they can uh, help uh, enlighten uh, Congress as to what we should be doing to prevent this from happening in the future. Representative Engel, have you heard back from Chairman Upton? Well, no, we have not, but the letter was just recently sent out, and it was sent to Chairman Upton and uh, Chairman Walden, who's the rank, who's the uh, um, chairman of the Telecommunications Subcommittee. Um, this uh, hearing, this proposed hearing, is, again, um, not to uh, be adversarial in any way, shape, or form. It should be bipartisan, and um, we really want to find out what happened. And I don't think there's anyone uh, who would not want to do that. In, in fact, um, I would take it one step further. I would, I would like to see another hearing, a separate hearing from this, to look at the utilities, the, uh, the performance of the utility companies, not only telecommunications, but the utilities. You know, we know that there were problems, and again, the point of this is not to finger point, but to find out what we can do to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Now, will you be attending any of the FCC field hearings that are going to be held? The FCC just announced those. Well, I would certainly uh, would like to or to have staff attend. I mean, I, I just think it's important that we get to the bottom of what happened. I realize that this was a, a perfect storm, so to speak, and the storm of the century. But um, with climate change and, and everything that seems to be happening, we're getting more and more of these storms, and it's becoming more and more common. So I think that anything we can do to get to the bottom of it, and again, not only to find out what happened, but to use when we find out what happened to ensure that it doesn't happen again and, and ensure that we can, we can prevent uh, these, these tragedies 
uh, from happening because again it's not just an inconvenience for people uh, it's it's dangerous if someone does not have access to 911 facilities uh, if someone uh, can't c- contact anybody, obviously this uh, is uh, puts people in grave danger, and so we need to make sure this this doesn't happen again. On a personal level, did you lose your cell phone service? No, I did not. Um, I didn't lose it, and I personally didn't didn't lose my power either. Um, but many people in my constituency did. Um, there were many people who uh, did not have cell service for uh, well over a week, did not have um, cable and, and, and wireless for over a week, and uh, many people were, were in the dark, had no power for, for two weeks and more. So it was really a, a, a very uh, difficult time, and we had destruction. Of course, my, my district had destruction. There were other districts that were impacted even more heavily than mine, but uh, mine was, was impacted, and many people were suffered, suffered as a result. Old. Representative Elliot Engel is a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. He joins us here on The Communicators. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My pleasure.